Hi everybody, welcome to the California Academy of Sciences here in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. We're about to do a Valentine's Day program here with our African Pink Colony. My name is Sparks and I've been here at the Academy for two years and I've worked with penguins for around five years. Alright guys, so please comment below. We're going to be doing a little penguin painting program in a bit and with whoever uh, comments, we'll choose randomly one person and they will win a penguin portrait. Uh, so right now we're going to be beginning the penguin show by uh, doing scale training. So scale training uh, helps us like monitor the bird's health and weight uh, so we can pretty much decide uh, when birds like are going off feed or if they are not feeling really well by monitoring their weight. So this is also a different form of enrichment. Uh, so we do a lot of different forms of enrichment here at the Academy. Uh, on top of scale training, we like to give them nesting material. We blow them bubbles. And as you can see right now, uh, Amy's having the penguins come one by one and step on top of the scale. And while they're doing that, Kelsey is recording the penguins' weight. She's also recording how many fish these guys are eating. So we have two different species of fish that we feed and offer these guys. Uh, so we have Caitlin and we have herring. Herring are a lot bigger, a lot fattier fish. So in the wild, these guys typically uh, would be eating anchovies, sardines, so a similar type of fish. But since those guys aren't really sustainable for us to harvest, we offer them cake land and dairy. Uh, so you can see Stanley right here. She is going through the scale process. And we have one of our newer little birds, Thule. Thule is um, a, a bonded pair with our male tucks. So this was part of the species survival program where uh, we had the choice of uh, getting a new female for our male. Sorry guys, sometimes when the penguins honk like that, it's called braying. And braying is just a different, is a form of their communication. Um, but back to Thule, you can see little Thule right over here behind Stanley. Uh, Thule, if you uh, notice, has different color plumage than the rest of the birds. So Thule is still a juvenile. Um, she's around a year old, so if you guys remember Stanley, like Stanley right here, Stanley used to have uh, the same color plumage as Tuli, but they go through something called a catastrophic molt. And during this process, these birds get almost landlocked and kind of fluff up like a dandelion. And during that time, they expunge all their feathers and come out with a new shiny coat. So that's kind of what happened to Stanley. Stanley used to look just like Tuli and now Stanley has her adult plumage. Um, so Julie should be going through her molting process uh, to get her adult plumage in about a year. Um, Stanley uh, now has her adult plumage, so she has been paired up with a new male. Unfortunately, he's in a mess, bo mess box right now and he is going through his molting process. But his name is Bernie. Um, so she has now a recommended mate, uh, and again through the species survival program, uh, that's where we get to pair different birds based on their genetics, and Stanley was recommended uh, to be paired with Bernie, and Thule has a, was paired to be bonded with Tucks. Um, yeah, so we'll continue to go through some of the scale training with you guys. Uh, these guys are also found in Southern Africa. So why these guys are a part of a species survival program is because they are endangered. And what species survival programs do is they help to keep the genetic diversity and uh, good genetics within the stable population under human care. So we can continue to have these birds and uh, keep the genetics very strong within uh, 
the human like human care population. Uh, and just in case if anything ever were to happen, this is a good way for us to have genetic stock for reintroduction processes. Uh, another one of the reasons why these guys are endangered is because, like I was saying, like I was saying about the fish. Uh, a lot of the fish that they have been, that they typically eat, are getting overfished for human consumption. Um, so there is a group down in Southern Africa called Sankov. And Sankov's a really great organization. Amy actually went to Sankov. Uh, and Amy, do you want to talk a little bit more about what that is? Yeah, so Sankov stands for the South African Foundation for the Conservation of Coastal Birds. And they're basically a rehab center uh, that's in Cape Town, and they will bring in any sick or injured uh, or malnourished birds, including chicks, um, into their facility, feed them up, do any uh, maybe medical things that are necessary. They have the ability to do surgery there, and then they'll release those birds back out into the wild so that they can be um, in their normal, natural populations. Um, over the holidays, they actually brought in 1,600 uh, cormorant chicks that have been abandoned um, on an island by their parents. Um, we're still not really sure why all those chicks were abandoned, uh, but that's 1,600 chicks that were able to be fed and raised up, um, and I think that they're slowly starting to release those birds back out, um, and if Sandcom didn't exist, we wouldn't be able to help out um, those bird populations. Um, they also help with oil spills, um, so we try uh, we try and help them as much as possible. Uh, we're really uh, grateful and thankful that uh, during COVID, we've still been able to uh, do our quarterly funding for them um, that we, we send to help with their uh, different food supplies and needs that are there um, while they are still running their operations. And then hopefully this year or next year, we can continue sending biologists to physically help uh, with their, their bird populations there as well. Sorry guys, we might have a penguin trying to mess with the tripod, so let me try to move him real quick. Come here, Dunker. Come here. All righty. Sorry, and also as you guys can see, Stanley is a very, very friendly penguin. Uh, most penguins are typically not as friendly as Stanley. Stanley was hand reared by us. Um, so a lot of times what we, we do with captive populations of penguins is uh, after the eggs are laid, uh, they go through the process of being um, reared partially by the parents and then we do something called fish school. And fish school is when they get the, the chicks get to come and get to have more human interactions to make it easier for us to deal with them. So most of these birds at some point have had a lot of human interaction while they were younger. Uh, it also like shows and helps and gains the trust with them so we can do certain different types of enrichment and uh, different things with them. So, we'd like to take some questions at this time, or does anybody have any questions uh, while we finish wrapping up our scale training? Yes, I think we have some questions. Let me just check on my phone, guys. One second, I'm getting them delivered straight to me. Um, okay, so, Amy, Amanda asked, how do you tell the males and females apart? That's a great question. So penguins are not sexually dimorphic, meaning that the males are larger than the females, or the females are larger than the males. Uh, so we kind of see this like an elephant seal. Um, so they look very similar just by looking at them. So we can actually only tell 100% about through blood work. So when they hatch out their egg, uh, once we are able to do a blood draw at about uh, a month or so, we can send that blood off to the lab and they will let us know if it is a male or female. And then we put uh, a wing band on them, so all of our males are banded on the right, all of the females are on the left, and if we see two of the same color, like there's two reds right here, that means that that's a body pair or a couple. Um, so that's the easiest way for us to tell who is who in here. All right, and we have another question from Lexi. Do penguins have strong beaks? <laughs> Amy? That is a definite yes. Um, they, their beaks are probably their most powerful weapon that they have. They do need to be able to defend themselves since they are a wild animal. So those beaks are very important. They're very sharp. Um, so they use them for feeding, obviously, and then they also use them for defense um, towards other birds. So it's their, their front facing, um, and then they will kind of, this is very gently, obviously, um, but they will nip things. Um, when you do get bit, it's like getting a bunch of paper cuts um, because their beak on the side is so sharp. Um, and then when they are defending, 
when they're defending from a predator, uh, they will do a bite and twist, uh, which does not uh, feel very good. So they will try and defend themselves, uh, which is really important when you're a wild animal. Uh, we have another question from Tessa. How do you become a biologist? That's a great question. Yeah, we get a lot of questions about how um, people can get involved with uh, working with animals here at the Academy or other um, zoos or aquariums. Um, and uh, the best way is to just volunteer. Um, if you are in high school or college, uh, volunteer with your local zoo or aquarium. Get to know um, the ins and outs of how animals work, um, how how you can take care of them the best, the different types of species, their natural history, things like that. Um, and then a lot of people start uh, working part-time like Kelsey does and then just kind of gain as much experience as possible. Um, and a lot of the times, honestly, you have to be in the right place at the right time, um, which is how a lot of us got our start. So um, it is definitely a passion job, so make sure that you uh, just Try and uh, immerse yourself as much as possible um, just in uh, the knowledge of uh, different species. All right, and we'll do one more question for right now, and then we'll get back to answering some more questions in a little bit. Uh, so the last question uh, for right now is from Lee, age 8. How long does it take a baby penguin to hatch? That's a great question. So um, when, once the egg um, is laid in the nest, it takes, it depends on bird, a different species of birds, obviously, um, but for these guys, African penguins, it takes about 38 to 42 days or so um, for the egg to hatch, um, which is a lot quicker uh, than us humans, um, but longer than uh, things like chickens. Alright, guys. So, we're, we're going to get everything set up really quickly. We're going to be doing our Valentine's hands out. And uh, so what these are, are these are little heart-shaped felt pieces that the penguins use as nesting material. So these guys, typically in the wild, will gather like sticks, rocks, and make a very shallow indent uh, in a, like, a part of a, like a rock cave or out on uh, just the ground itself. Um, so here, what we do to uh, give them is we give them different things like these felt cutouts of hearts or kelp. They'll even take shells sometimes, and they'll take them to their nest and arrange them. This also helps uh, the pairs form stronger bonds. Uh, so we have some birds that like to build very extravagant nests, and other birds like to like put one or two little pieces and call it a day. So we'll see. I'm gonna see if Stanley's gonna try to take a nest, uh, try, try to take a heart to her mate Bernie. We'll see. You gonna go, Stanley? <laughs> and she wants. Yeah, I think she wants to stay in my lap. Oh, okay. oh, there she goes. You want to give oh, it to me? You want to give it to me? No? Yeah? Oh, thank you, Stanley. That's a great part. Thank you so much. Oh, this, uh, we had this one. Uh, so when we were open, we had some uh, uh, members and other people write Valentine's. And this one is for Stanley. Roses are red, new chicks like Stanley are a plus. The best species of all is Spinistus diversus. Do you want to take Stanley's heart? Oh, and this is Fox <laughs> right here, and now it's like right side too late. So, and you can guys see, you get a little closer look at the band coloration. So, you see, we keep our pairs with the, uh, so to help us, uh, different differentiate which the bird, uh, birds are bonded with you because they do look so similar uh, to the untrained eye. Uh, we do give them these band colorations uh, for each side of the wing to help us decide you know, which one's male and female, which one is a bonded pair. So we'll see if Tux will take one back uh, to his little box for Thule. But it seems like he just wants to uh, get a little bit of attention and play with all the hearts right now. Isn't that right, buddy? Oh, there goes Ty. Ty, taking, Ty and Robin are also a bonded pair, and it looks like she dropped her, and we'll leave it up to uh, her mate Robin to take it back to the nest for, for them. Tuck, you going to do anything with those, buddy? I think he thinks this is his nest. He might <laughs> think this is his nest, that's right. That's right. You just want more and more? So we give them uh, these felt cutouts uh, about once a week, uh, so they can 
take them back and begin doing different nesting behaviors. Uh, again, like I was saying, it does help form a stronger pair bond with them. Uh, and lots of times we do change it up. We give them little shells and stuff, and it's really fun to like try to watch them use their beaks to try to pick those things up. Um, also, within the habitat, we have different sea stars, and we feed the sea stars clams. So if you're ever here or watching a live cam, sometimes you'll be able to see a penguin. Oops, she sneezed. Uh, carrying clamshells in their beaks to bring back up to their nest boxes. Oh, and Tux is right back here with us, holding his heart and wanting to put on a show too. And as you can see what Stanley was trying to do to my arm is preening. Preening is another very strong form of pair bonding that penguins do to, uh, oh, hey, Julie, to, uh, to reassure that bond that they have. So, as you guys can see, Tuli still has her uh, juvenile plumage, uh, just like Stanley used to have, and she will eventually, probably within a year, go to her molt and end up looking like Stanley. Um, another interesting, well, oh, there goes some brain. Uh, another interesting fact is about these guys' shape. So a lot of times you'll see how easily they move and glide through the water. Um, so their shape, they're built almost like kind of the, what looks like a football. Uh, it's called fusiform shape, uh, and it helps them move uh, extremely well through the uh, water column. And sometimes you'll see all these little air bubbles flowing, um, coming from the penguins. That's actually not them releasing air, that's air that is trapped in between their feathers that acts as like an insulation from the cold water that they are uh, swimming in. Uh, you can also notice that why penguins are black and white. So, it's called counter shading. So a lot of animals in the animal kingdom uh, also have these color patterns, like orca whales. Uh, so it's also it's a form of camouflage for these guys. So if you're a predator looking at a penguin from underneath, underneath them in the water column and looking upwards, you know when you're looking up in the water, it's very light, and so that's why their bellies are white because it helps them. Sh uh, helps them blend in. And the same goes if you're a predator looking at them from above down below because when you're looking down in the ocean it's very dark. That's why the top of them are very dark. So, all right. I think it's time we're gonna answer just a few more questions really quickly. So, let's see. From Jen, do they respond to their names. Amy? Yeah, so we have um, a couple of our birds that definitely know their names. Tux knows his name, Dunker knows his name. Um, but since we have been close during uh, this past year, we've been able to do a lot more training and speak to them since we're not doing our regular programs. So we've been able to um, say their name while they're being fed, and that has reinforced a lot of um, different behaviors, like if we want one of them to um, come closer to us, um, if we need to look at a medical exam, um, I can ask Dunker to come closer to me, um, and he knows his name, um, that he will come uh, because he knows that I'm speaking to him specifically. So it's, it's been really helpful um, to be able to teach these birds and to train them that that is their name and that they can come and respond to it. All right, and this question is from Wynn. Uh, who is the sassiest penguin? I think we all have different opinions of who the sassiest is. Uh, my personal pick for that would probably be Grendel. Oh. Grendel is a very sassy uh, little old man penguin. Uh, he's paired up with our oldest bird, Dawson, who's about to be 37. Amy, who would you think would be the sassiest penguin in your opinion? I think Stanley's the sassiest. Okay. Um, she. She knows that she's loved, um, and she will definitely come up and um, ask for attention, as you can see. Um, but they all have their sassy moments, for sure. Yes, they do. Oh, she drooled. <laughs> <laughs> drooled on my phone. All right. Let's see. Oops. All right. This question is from Ryan. Ryan asked, how many penguins have been born at the Academy? So we have had, since we have been um, an institution that has African penguins, um, I believe from the 80s, we've had, I, I believe, 115 birds hatch out, uh, African penguins hatch out. Um, and then uh, since we reopened in 2008, I believe that number is like 11 or 12. Um, and Stanley was our last one. Um, Tuli did not hatch 
that for, even though she is a juvenile. Um, she's from Monterey Bay, but Stanley was our last one in November of 2018. All right. Uh, we have a question from Owen, age 12. How do the penguins react to wearing masks? Oh, that's a great question. It's a really good question. Um, I haven't, from um, what I can remember, I don't remember any of our animals reacting differently to us wearing masks. Um, we thought the macaws would, for sure would freak out because any new thing in their environment takes them a couple days to figure out. The penguins, um, even when we introduced new enrichment, like when we first introduced the scale, um, they didn't really like that. Um, so we thought for sure the mask would be weird, but they've been totally fine with it. Yep. I think also like they know our voices. So when they hear our voices, it's still like to them, they like recognize that. So it kind of like helps mutter it. Uh, we are getting a lot of questions about what uh, the bands are on the guy, on these guys. So I'll go back through. Uh, we banned our birds because one, it's really hard to tell them apart. Penguins aren't sexually dimorphic, meaning males and females are almost identical looking. So in captivity, what we do is we put bands on the birds as an identifier. Uh, so a, a pair of birds that are bonded together share the same color. Females on one side, males on the other side. So you can see, well, I guess you just left the frame, but Dunker has a red band on the right. All males are banded on the right. Females are only banded on the left. Uh, and then usually, typically, chicks or birds that are not paired together will have a band with a color with maybe like a white line through it because that helps us know that these birds, uh, this bird is not paired with anybody currently. Um, yeah, you want to get on the scale? I think we're going to take a few minutes real quick to get ready to do a penguin painting. Um, so during that time, you guys enjoy watching the birds a little bit. Sometimes some of the birds uh, are a little more hesitant, just depending on the bird's nature and personality, to get on the scale. So Robin right here typically uh, doesn't like to get on the scale a lot. And very surprisingly, he is wanting to do it right now. So definitely want to take that opportunity so we can get his weight and get that checked so we can monitor his health condition. Anybody else want a part? Kianga? Ooh. Hey. So a lot of times you'll see different penguins fighting, or it looks like they're fighting. That's just them just, uh, showing each other who, like almost who is who's boss. Uh, penguins within the colony, there's a lot of dominant birds. Uh, a lot of times these guys do like to fight over different who has the prime nest box. And Prime nest box is high real estate here in the game with penguin colonies. Uh, so a lot of times you will see a lot of the males, especially closer to breeding season. Um, you might see them like pulling each other feathers. This is totally natural behavior with these guys. It's not like they're acting mean or anything. It's totally naturally what you would see in the wild. Um, and during that time when they're going through the phase of like trying to pick on a nest box, uh, that's when the females will be getting ready to lay eggs. Penguins typically lay an alpha egg and a beta egg. Um, and th they're both incubated at the same time. After the, sec the beta egg is laid, and typically they are born in twos. Uh, Stanley was born, uh, she was the beta egg. The alpha egg uh, was not fertile. And so Stanley was born uh, only as a single, and typically we like to raise these guys with other with other chicks to uh, so help them socialize. All right, guys, we're gonna take the camera over and get ready for some penguin painting. So just hold on one second.
So Penguin Painting, um, it's a fun thing that we like to do every once in a while. Um, it's great um, for us to be able to give um, Penguin Paintings to um, people like donors or um, like uh, different people who have done really important things um, for the Academy for our Penguins. Um, and uh, it's just a fun thing to do. Um, so today, I thought it would be fun to do um, red and pink for Valentine's Day. Um, so Stanley is going to um, walk through it. She likes doing penguin paintings, but sometimes, uh, because she's sassy like we already established, um, it might take her a second, so we'll see um, how she does today. <laughs> and then the trouble is having her come back. So, and again, guys, this paint is non-toxic, so it does not... Uh, and yes, I wanted to reiterate, guys, that this is non-toxic paint. Uh, we would not give uh, them any form of toxic paint uh, that would allow them to hurt these guys, so... Oh, that's a pretty one! There's Stanley's second one. And a reminder that if you are interested in possibly winning um, one of these paintings, to um, comment uh, down below. You can ask a question um, or just simply say you love penguins or whatever you want to say. You ready for more? No? <laughs> um, so another fun thing about enrichment um, is that we don't want to force them to do anything that, you, that they don't want to do, obviously. Um, and you can see that Stanley does enjoy doing this. Um, she loves walking through the paint, um, and she also just loves being with us. Okay, last one. Go ahead. Oh, you missed it. <laughs> oh, Stanley. running. Okay, let's go, girl. Yeah, so these were some of our paintings done by Stanley. She did a great job. <laughs> and then she'll get a bath after this. Because yeah. her feet are all painting. Do we have any more questions, Marks? Uh, let's see if we have any more. So we can take just a few more questions and then we will... Uh, this is from Olivia. Age six. How do penguins breathe underwater? Ooh, so penguins, just like us, actually breathe air. So when they go underwater, they're holding their breath just like we do. Um, and they can hold their breath. Normally it's about a minute and a half to two minutes because uh, they aren't diving terribly deep. They're diving deeper than we can. Um, they're normally going to about 100 feet uh, below the surface of the water to get their fish. And then they'll just pop back up to the surface. All right, and uh, one last question is, do penguins mate for life? Um, so this is kind of a hard question for us to answer uh, because they are um, kind of a monogamous species where they will um, mate with the same partner from season to season, and they will form very strong pair bonds, um, like our birds here. But a lot of people think that monogamous and mate for life means that they won't find somebody else if they lose their partner. Uh, so these guys um, will find somebody else if necessary. Um, and also they might lose their partner out at sea. If they're not successful breeding with each other, they will find somebody else that they are more successful with. Um, so yeah, these guys, definitely really important. All right, and one last question, that's all we have time for, is this one's from Kate. Do penguins like cold weather or warm weather? Ooh, that depends on the species. So these guys, are from South Africa, so they, they like warm weather. Um, but most penguins actually um, are believed to, to uh, live in cold weather, but that's not actually the truth. Um, so there's uh, about uh, 18 different species of penguins. Most of them are in warm weather. There's only about four species that are in Antarctica in that cold weather. Um, so these guys are from warmer weather. Most penguin species are actually in New Zealand in warmer weather, so it just kind of depends um, the different type of species, if they like cold weather or warm weather. 
All right, guys, that's all the time we have for today. I just wanted to say thank you from the California Academy of Sciences here in San Francisco for joining in on our Penguins Valentines. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, guys. Have a great day.